Good evening. Thanks for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Shireen Bhan. The headlines we're tracking this evening. I call this, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a quintessential self-help story. Uh, India is helping itself uh, probably dominate the world. It's likely to be India's growth decade. India can be the f office and the factory of the world, says Morgan Stanley's Rhythm This I expects financials, consumer discretionary, IT services and industrials to drive growth this decade. That's an exclusive. Stock markets across the world tread with caution ahead of the U.S. Federal Reserve's decision later tonight. A CNBC survey shows Wall Street expects another 75 basis point hike. Investors also believe the Fed could signal a slower pace of hikes from December. RBI Governor defends the central bank's handling of inflation, says acting prematurely would have come at a cost to citizens and the economy. Also confirms the MPC meet tomorrow will solely focus on the letter to the government over missing the inflation targets as the ball is in the government's court on making the letter public. There is no scope to reduce fuel prices, say government sources as under recoveries on diesel currently stand at 27 rupees a litre. Oil marketing companies are likely to get further government support apart from the 22,000 crore rupees already paid for LPG under recoveries. The union cabinet increases fertilizer subsidy for the rubby season by 30,000 crore rupees, also hikes the procurement price of ethanol for public sector companies by approving a new mechanism. The Adani Group proposes to hike the user convenience fee at the Ahmedabad airport for domestic travellers by sevenfold, also seeks to double the fee for international travellers. The move will need the approval of the airport tariff regulator. Elon Musk announces an $8 monthly subscription to a Twitter blue tick certification and other features, claims the move is essential to defeat spam and scam on the platform. Russia says it will rejoin the deal allowing the export of food grains from Ukraine's ports after suspending it over the weekend. Russian Defense Ministry says it has received written guarantee from Ukraine that it will not launch military operations using the Black Sea Grain Corridor. Search operations continue for the fourth day after the collapse of the Morbi Hanging Bridge that killed 135 people. The top brass of the Ariva Group, which is responsible for the maintenance of the bridge, remain on the run. Four of the nine arrested so far have been remanded to police custody till Saturday by the magistrate's court. Early voting underway in the U.S. midterm elections, which promises to be a litmus test for President Joe Biden. Democrats currently control both the House and Senate, but face an uphill battle. We preview the key races on the show. Well, stock markets across the world are treading with caution ahead of the U.S. Fed decision later tonight. The Lal Street did snap its four-day gaining streak. The Sensex was down over 200 points. The Nifty did manage to hold on to the 18,000 mark despite falling over 60 points. Banks and mid-cap saw some profit booking today, but all eyes on what the Fed is likely to do. The big CNBC TV 18 newsmaker this evening. India is set to become the world's third largest economy and stock market by 2031. That's as per a Morgan Stanley Blue Paper. Speaking exclusively to me, Rhythm Desai, the managing director of Morgan Stanley India, said India is primed for high growth over the next 10 years and it can become the office and the factory of the world. Desai expects financials, consumer discretionary IT services and industrials to drive growth this decade. All the labor that we put in, in terms of policy and other things, are now bearing, I think, fruit. Uh, there are also a few things happening globally that are helping us. Uh, so it seems like a sweet spot for India. Uh, in fact, as uh, you know, as we highlight in the report, uh, stunningly, India could account for 20 percent of uh, the growth that the world will generate over the next 10 years. So it's a very, very big shift. India has grown uh, quite well over the past few years, but its share in the global economy uh, is is changing in a very dramatic fashion. Now, I'm sensing that companies in India are getting more optimistic. Uh, they are starting to run into some capacity constraints. And therefore, there should be a pretty good CapEx cycle in the next two, three years. And that will be great for earnings. Uh, so that's something that we'll watch out for as well. But I think India is set to now become a meaningful part of the global supply chain. And a lot of companies will reveal this to you, that they're receiving orders uh, hitherto, they didn't have access to those orders because, you know, Chinese companies used to take those orders and they are now all set to increase capacity to service these export orders. On top of this, 
multinational companies are looking at India as a very attractive destination. And you can catch that conversation with Rhythm Desai, Managing Director Morgan Stanley at 9.30 p.m. right here on CNBC TV 18. The big event that markets are awaiting, the U.S. Federal Reserve is expected to announce the fourth 75 basis point hike in benchmark interest rates later tonight. But investors also believe that the Fed could signal a slower pace of hikes from December. Steve Leesman joins us now with the key highlights of the CNBC Fed survey. Steve. The Fed's going to have to come up with either a new idea for, for what's going on in the job market, which I've maintained for a long time is kind of disconnected from what's happening with the funds rate and attempts to slow the economy because we're still putting people back to work. The Fed's going to have to rethink this outlook on jobs or it's going to have to concede to it. And the outlook is it's going to have to do more. And that's, I think, what the market is uh, is glomming onto here. Uh, when you look at our Fed survey, the only pivot they see, and I don't know how excited you want to get about this pivot, is from 75 down to 50 next month uh, in the December uh, meeting. Uh, but they still see the Fed going all the way up to 483 on uh, for a peak funds rate in March, which is a little earlier than the futures market is priced in. But there's the uh, that last line is probably the most important at this point, which is that they see the Fed maintaining that peak rate for up to 10 months. So you don't really get a real pivot, which is sort of rate cut until the end of next year. Um, and I don't know. I feel like the market's been really excited about this idea of pivoting from 75 to 50. I'm less excited by that because I still think the trajectory until the Federal Reserve gets some control on inflation, some sense of slack developing in the economy, I think the trajectory on rates is still up and higher. And you can catch our entire coverage of the U.S. Fed decision from 11 p.m. right here on CNBC TV 18. We'll be live from the Fed headquarters with reactions from Wall Street as Jerome Powell makes the announcement that's coming up tonight. From the U.S. Fed to the RBI governor, Governor Shakti Kanta Das has defended the central bank's handling of inflation. He also confirmed that the MPC meet tomorrow will solely focus on the letter that the RBI needs to write to the government over missing the inflation target. The governor has called the launch of the pilot project for the digital rupee a landmark moment in Indian finance. Ritu joins us to wrap up the governor's speech and the big takeaways. Well, a day after the launch of the pilot on wholesale digital rupee, the Reserve Bank of India Governor Shakti Kanta Das here today addressed the moment as a landmark one for the financial system, for India's economy as a whole, saying uh, after the launch of the digital currency, the way business is done is going to be completely transformed. He, however, said that the RBI will tread carefully when it comes to the full-fledged launch of the CBDC because they want to ensure that the entire process remains non-disruptive. It was indeed a landmark moment in the history of money, in the history of currency in our country. It's going to be a major transformation of the way business is done. Shakti Kanta Das compared uh, RBI's watch over inflation to Arjun's target on the fish eye, referring to uh, the scene in Mahabharat, saying they will target inflation uh, like Arjuna did the fish eye, and also uh, responding to criticism that the MPC or the RBI is keeping the letter on inflation that is to be written to the government uh, under wraps. He said it is not that the intention is to keep it under wraps forever, but it was not the pre prerogative of the RBI to release the letter to public before it reaches the addressee and that it will not remain uh, away from public eye forever and it will be up to the government to release it sooner than later. The inflation has remained above uh, six percent for three consecutive quarters and under the accountability uh, norms which are provided in the Reserve Bank of India Act we are expected to send a report to the government. I don't have the privilege authority or the luxury to release it to the media before even the addressee gets it. Shakti Kanta Das also took the opportunity to address concerns about the Reserve Bank of India remaining behind the curve when it comes to hiking interest rates, saying that had the RBI acted sooner than it did, the cost for the economy would have been far, far higher, and the economic recovery that we saw in the last year or so uh, would have been compromised had the RBI acted before the due time. That's Ritu reporting on the governor's speech. And the RBI governor there speaking at the FIKI banking conference. And speaking of FIKI, the industry body has elected Shubhrakant Panda as the next president. He's currently the managing director of the Indian Metals and Ferro Alloys, which employs about 6,500 people. He will succeed Sanjeev Mehta of HUL after the annual general meeting on the 16th and 17th of December. 
Well, here's another CNBC TV 18 exclusive tonight. There is no scope, or at least little scope at this point in time, to reduce fuel prices, say government sources, as under recoveries on diesel stand at 27 rupees a litre. Oil marketing companies are likely to get some further government support. This apart from the 22,000 crore rupees already paid by the government for LPG under recovery. So there was this expectation that the government may bring down prices, but at this point in time, it looks like a fuel price cut is unlikely and perhaps more government intervention, more government support for oil marketing companies is on the cards. The union cabinet has increased the fertilizer subsidy for the rubby season by 30,000 crore rupees, also hiked the procurement price of ethanol for public sector companies by approving a new mechanism. Delhi's government has appealed to people to work from home and also use shared transport to reduce vehicular pollution as air quality continues to worsen. The government has also imposed a fine of 5 lakh rupees on Larsen and Tupro for violating the ban on construction and demolition work. In the aviation space, the Ahmedabad International Airport, operated by Adani Airport, has proposed to hike the user development fee for domestic departures as well as international departures. The charges proposed are seven times more than the current charges. Madhiha Mujawa joins us now with the details. Madhiha, how is this likely to impact travellers? And more importantly, has this been approved by the regulator? Air travellers flying from Ahmedabad might have to pay more starting from February next year. The Ahmedabad International Airport, operated by Adani Airports, has proposed to hike user development fee from the current 100 rupees to 703 rupees for domestic departure. These rates will increase to 738 rupees in FY25 and 775 rupees in FY26. The proposal also seeks UDA for international departure to be hiked from current 703 rupees to 1400 rupees from February, which will then be raised to 1544 rupees in FY26. The airport in its submission said that the revenue target for airport-related services comes to 3,854 crore rupees. The air tariff regulator, that is ERA, had observed that the existing traffic base is not sufficient for complete recovery of the aggregate revenue requirement and would require a significant increase in tariffs. The airport has also estimated a cost of 11,000 crore rupees for the proposed development projects. While the hike proposed by the Ahmedabad airport is quite steep, it's not the first time that a private airport operator has sought a raise in UDF. Mengaluru Airport, also run by Adani Airports, has proposed to hike UDF from current 150 rupees to 250 rupees for both domestic departure as well as arrivals and increase it to 725 rupees till March 2025. Earlier, the GMR group had also proposed to hike UDF at Hyderabad International Airport. It wanted to hike UDF for domestic departure from 281 rupees to 608 rupees, but was allowed to go ahead with just 480 rupees. So the Ahmedabad Airport's UDF hike is also subject to the regulator's approval. Aviation experts who have been tracking these airport charges say the regulator factors in total cost inflation and how other airports undertook similar expansion in the past as well as passenger growth projections to calculate and approve the UDF. Madhya, many thanks for joining us. That is the proposal by Adani Airports for the Ahmedabad Airport to hike the user development fee. Uh, that will be applicable from February of next year if, of course, the regulator gives the approval. To another development from the aviation space, and this is along expected lines, Malaysian airline AirAsia has sold its remaining 16.3% stake in AirAsia India to Air India, marking the airline's exit from the Indian carrier. With this, the Tatas now completely own Air India, Air India Express and AirAsia. Air India is also in talks with Singapore Airlines for a potential integration of Vistara with Air India. So this paves the way for the consolidation of AirAsia India with Air India Express. Twitter's new owner and sole director, Elon Musk, has announced an $8 monthly subscription to certify blue ticks and other features, including long-form video and audio posting. Now, the decision is in sync with Elon Musk's plans to establish Twitter as a less ad-reliant model. Abhishek Dattaroy explains why Musk is banking on a subscription-based business model amidst concerns raised by advertisers in the last few days. Days after sauntering inside the Twitter headquarters carrying a sink, Elon Musk has dissolved the company's board and is reshaping it as the sole director.
Musk, whose current Twitter profile designates him as the complaint hotline operator, wants users to pay $8 for the blue ticks, a sign of honor on the social messaging platform. In a series of tweets, Musk trained his guns on what he called the current lords and peasants system, invoked power to the people and listed out a bouquet of benefits for those who buy the subscription. This includes priority in replies, mentions and search, ability to post long video and audio, half as many ads and a paywall bypass for interested publishers. Remember, Twitter Blue, a premium subscription-based service, is already available to users in the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. But there is so far no official data on the number of users. While Twitter has not yet laid out a timeline, Musk's decision to charge users for a blue tick is in sync with his plans to steer towards a less ad-dependent model. 89% of Twitter's 2021 revenue came via the digital ads route. Musk has repeatedly said that he wants the platform which he acquired for $44 billion after months of dithering and uncertainty to be less reliant on ads. The message from the chief twit is clear, and I quote, To all complainers, please continue complaining, but it will cost $8, end of quote. As per reports, Twitter presently has over 4.23 million verified users. Even if 10% of them were to sign up, it would bring Twitter $4.1 million of additional revenue a year. Several advertisers have exited the platform in the last few days, raising doubts over Musk's content moderation plans. There are concerns about Elon Musk's strategy on content moderation, this despite assurances from Musk that Twitter cannot become a free-for-all hellscape. IPG, one of the world's largest ad companies, has already advised clients to pause their spending on Twitter, but Elon Musk is no short of supporters. I would never, ever underestimate Elon. The $44 billion acquisition has been termed expensive by several tech experts and Wall Street. Musk has already laid off top executives and more pink slips could be in the offing. And after railing against ads on Twitter for far too long, charging a fee for blue ticks could be essential for Elon Musk to service the debt. With Abhishek Datta Roy in Mumbai, this is Shireen Bhan for CNBC TV 18. And the debate rages on. But let's shift our focus to the startup space. Arundhati Ramanan joins us now to give us a wrap of the key startup headlines tonight. Aru. Thanks so much for that, Shireen. A lot of action from the startup world, and here are all the developments. Danzel's losses have gone to 464 crore rupees in FY22, even as revenue doubled to over 54 crore rupees. Now, the delivery app lost 230 rupees on each daily order during the first half of this year. Baiju's reverses its decision to shut down its Thiruvananthapuram product development center after a meeting with Kerala Chief Minister Pinarayi Vijayan and the company founder Baiju Ravindran. Now, 140 associates who are asked to relocate or resign will continue to operate from that center. Staying with Baiju's reports say that it is in talks to take its physical tutoring chain Akash public. Baiju's looks to raise $800 million to $1 billion via this IPO, which could happen as early as February. Now, AI lending platform Upstart lays off around 140 employees as it faces weakening demand for loans in the US on the back of significant hikes in interest rates. The lending platform has about 2,000 employees. Google plans to discontinue its dedicated Street View app on Android next year. The company has advised users to move to Google Maps or Street View Studio by the 31st of March next year. With that, it is back to you, Shireen. All right, Aru, many thanks for joining us. Uh, those are the startup headlines tonight. We will head into a break, but when we return, early voting underway in the U.S. midterm election, which promises to be a litmus test for President Joe Biden. That and more when we get back. Big national story that we continue to track. Search operations continue for the fourth day after the Mordby Bridge collapse that killed more than 135 people. Meanwhile, as per reports, the top brass of the Ariba group that was in charge of maintaining the bridge are on the run. Four of the nine arrested so far have been remanded to police custody until Saturday by the magistrate's court. We are here in the Machu River. This was the place where uh, uh, the bridge was located. Uh, you can see that this was the bridge. And you can see that only one end of the ropes, uh, that's intact. The other portion collapsed. It claimed more than 135 lives. The search and rescue operation continues on the fourth day. Uh, there may be one or two persons, uh, two missing persons are in the, uh, are, uh, in the river. 
So that's why uh, we are continuously conducting such operations. Jamila Bain is one of the survivors of uh, Morbi tragedy. She went on the bridge with seven other family members of her, but unfortunately, none of them survived the tragedy. <laughs> Arif Shah lost his wife and two children to the tragedy. According to the uh, sources from local authorities, at least 12,000 people visited the bridge in those four days before the tragedy happened. In Morbi with camera person Balbir Singh, this is Santya for CNBC TV18. A quick check of some of the global headlines tonight. Russia says it will resume its participation in a deal to free up vital grain exports from Ukraine after suspending it over the weekend. The defense ministry says it has received written guarantees that Kyiv will not use the Black Sea grain corridor for military operations against Russia. Jair Bolsonaro breaks his silence after becoming the first incumbent president to lose a re-election in modern Brazilian history, says he will follow Brazil's constitution, however avoids conceding defeat to veteran politician Lula da Silva, but his aides say he will not contest the result. Israel's longest-serving Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu may return to power. His alliance is tipped to win a majority of the 120-seat parliament. Netanyahu is opposed to the creation of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip as a solution to the Israel-Palestinian conflict. North and South Korea fired missiles into waters near each other's coast. The North Korean regime says that the missile launches are in response to joint military exercises currently being conducted by South Korea and the United States. South Korea has called the act an unacceptable breach of its territory. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will now travel to Egypt to attend the COP27 summit after his initial decision to skip it invited harsh criticism from opposition leaders and even his climate advisor. Sunak tweeted that there would be no long-term prosperity without action on climate change or energy security without investing in renewables. China has locked down the area around Foxconn Technology Group's main plant, which is home to the world's largest iPhone factory. There were reports of rising COVID cases inside the factory, after which it has been placed under a lockdown for seven days. Eunice Yoon reports on how this move could impact iPhone's production. Well, only a day after the city of Zhengzhou said that it was going to ease off its effective lockdown, the industrial area that houses the Foxconn facility said that it's going to reimpose very strict COVID controls. So uh, these are uh, quite harsh. Uh, the, uh, they, the authority said that there will be no transportation except for essential services, that everyone is going to be ordered to stay inside and also to work from home. Um, the, uh, they're not even going to allow people to go outside to buy groceries. And then the only time you are allowed to leave the house is to take pa part in the mass testing rounds. So um, this is... Uh... Eunice Yoon there reporting on the lockdown in China, the Foxconn facility, which is the largest iPhone production facility, being locked down. The U.S. midterm elections are in the home stretch. President Joe Biden's approval rating is ticking higher, but only 40 percent of Americans approve of his performance. The Republicans are gaining momentum as well, and elections are pointing to a cliffhanger across several states. Sanjana and Arundhati explain the significance of the U.S. midterm elections and how this could impact the next U.S. presidential race in 2024. Early voting has begun across America for the midterm elections. As things stand, the Democrats control two branches of the government. Joe Biden in the White House gives them control of the executive. And they hold a majority in both the House of Representatives and Senate, giving them control over the legislature. But that could all change. Two years after the presidential elections and two years before the next one, Americans get to choose their lawmakers. Each state has two senators whose term lasts for six years. Congressmen, on the other hand, serve two-year terms. This election, all 435 seats in the House of Representatives are up for grabs, while only one-third of seats available in the Senate will be contested on on the 8th of November. This year, the Republicans need a net gain of just one Senate seat and four House seats to control the chamber. 
Opinion polls show Democrats will most likely lose control of the House, which they have held since 2018. However, they could still retain control of the Senate, and they are rolling out the big guns. The only way to save democracy is if we, together, nurture it and fight for it. And that starts with electing people who know you and see you and care about you. A handful of races can determine who gets control of the Senate. Let's start with Arizona, which was a Republican stronghold till 2020. Incumbent Democrat Mark Kelly is up against Republican Blake Masters. According to recent polling, Kelly is leading Masters by low single digits, and this race could go either way. A key battle in Pennsylvania is another one to keep an eye on. Reality TV star Mehmet Oz, popularly known as Dr. Oz, is up against Democrat John Fetterman. Dr. Oz is facing multiple scandals and he was a longtime resident of New Jersey, which may not play well with voters in Pennsylvania. John Fetterman suffered and overcame a stroke recently, but many Republicans are questioning if he is fit for office. Another pivotal state could be Georgia, where Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock and Republican candidate Herschel Walker are in a tight race. Incumbent Warnock is a pastor who turned to politics just last year. Herschel Walker is a former American football player whose campaign has been rocked by controversy. Walker is opposing abortion, but multiple women have come forward to say he paid for their abortion. And if a candidate's main qualification is that he's going to be loyal to Donald Trump, it means that he's not really going to be thinking about you and your needs. And you deserve better. Rising inflation, immigration, and abortion rights are the issues that could swing these midterm elections. The big issues that have roiled the campaign have been, of course, record high inflation and notably very high gas prices. Gas prices correlate very closely to party performance in the United States, and so the Democrats are, are, are on the ropes here. Um, the other issues that have been on the table, one has been crime. These elections are crucial for President Biden. If Republicans take control of both the House and the Senate, it will be a body blow to his legislative agenda. In Mumbai with Sanjana Udiyavar, Arundhati Ramanan. And before we wrap, Ila Bhatt, the founder of the Self-Employed Women's Association of India, Seva, and a pioneer of women's rights, has died at the age of 89 in Ahmedabad. She was one of India's most exemplary and iconic social activists, a lawyer by training. Bhatt was part of the International Labour Cooperative Women and Microfinance Movements and won several national and international awards, including the Max Sese Award, the Right Livelihood Award for helping home-based producers to organize for their welfare and self-respect, the Padma Bhushan and the Padma Shri.